Hello everyone. Welcome to the second lab of Prime Time uh, of Unit Five. In this lab, uh, we will focus on the post layout timing analysis. So we will talk about, uh, we will practically see all the concepts that we have been discussing in the lecture sessions of Unit Five. We will look at the propagated clocks. We will look at uh, the parasitics. We will look at the uh, uh, OCV settings, timing rates, uh, CRPR. And, and and so on, right? So we will we we'll, uh, focus on this, and uh, also during this whole session, please make a note of. I'll uh, keep pointing on the important things uh, that differ between pre layout and post layout, and just please uh, make a note of it. Uh, obviously, it is also mentioned in the lecture sessions also. So it will just try to make a connection between what changes when we go from pre layout to post layout. So our design is uh, this design comes from one of the synopsis examples. So this is the design uh, orca routed dot v this is an orca is a small cpu uh, i think it's open source uh, cpu a small cpu so it has a clock generator so it has uh, various blocks uh, it has a clock it has multiple the good thing is that it has multiple clocks uh, so we'll also look at the cases how to deal with, deal with multiple clocks this is the top level uh, orca and uh, inside it has some memories also some clock generation logic, there is a PLN also. So it's a good uh, test case for us to do. We also see, uh, let's take a look at the parasitics also. Uh, how does how does the parasitic file look like? So this is uh, dot spef. Uh, so uh, spef is uh, the uh, the header explains what is the what are the units. So the important thing is here is the capacitance unit on the R unit. There also L unit is specified, but uh, there are no L extractors. So since inductance is uh, negligible, uh, the extraction tools will not extract the in in inductance at all. Uh, so although L unit is present here, but there is no inductance available. So it has uh, the first section here, uh, then it's the name map section, where a number is assigned to every port and every net, every net, every pin, every port. So uh, that means uh, all uh, since the nets, so uh, parasitics are uh, characteristics of nets, not cells. Right? So, and a net is a connection between two cells. So, for each of these nets, uh, for each of these pins of cells, that they are a buffer connecting to a buffer, the net, uh, the spec will mention something like this that the RNC of a particular net between point A and point B is something. Now the point A will be, uh, for example, point A will be output pin of a particular cell. Point B will be input pin of a particular cell. All such pins are given some numbers. So this is the first section here. The name map is given is assigning some numbers to various pins. For example, see, see this: uh, the I or cut off IPCI core U cell. This this is a, a number uh, is assigned a number. Similarly, the uh, th these are input. So power save is an input to this uh, chip. So this is a complete chip. It even has power. So uh, it's kind of a small chip. Uh, the design is kind of a small chip. And so every uh, so there are various numbers here. Now uh, if we go uh, go forward, there will be a lot of numbers. Uh, and now let's go in the. Uh, so now uh, for every uh, so there is a, uh, a cap section. So this is a net. Uh, so uh, the section is a D net, and it's assigned. It's connected from a number, and so this is the connectivity from something I, so uh, to uh, something Z n. So this is this is the way it shows the connection. And for this particular uh, net, it will show what is the. So these are the segments. These are the net segments one, two, and three. For this particular net, post 3085, and it is given the capacitance of the uh, net with respect to the ground. So uh, it might also have the coupling cap, but I don't see it here. I need to double check it in prime time. But this is the way a space looks like. Looks like it has resistance, and for each net, it will have. Uh, let's say for for each net, it will have a cap value, a cap table, and a resistance table, and these are the nodes. Colon one, colon two, colon three. So, 
you can even try to pick up a particular net and see. Uh, so, as an assignment, what you can do, you can pick up a particular net in a net list, and correspondingly try to search for that net's RNC value in this form. So, this is a good assignment that way you can understand better how the syntax works. Works. I can do this here, but it's not that important, and it will take some time because the spec is a big file again, uh, uh, and searching through it uh, it takes time. So you can also do do this kind of debugging in prime time also. So uh, now, so we will uh, use this design for this particular assignment. Let's go to the work directory and open form. Okay. Now uh, I have already prepared a, a script, uh, so we will uh, again study what all goes into the script. Many of the sections are familiar to you. Some of the commands that are new will be specific to post -tail. So we will first say set the search path. The link library here is a is a is slightly big because it contains so many memories: RAM, 32, 32, 16, 128, and so on. So uh, clock it has a clock. Multiply and a PLL. So clock multiply and PLL both go, both are coming from this library special dot db. Memories come from RAM, uh, RAM something dot db. The IOs are also present here, so it, the IOs come from IOMAX dot db. So it is a very common phenomenon uh, because um, for each of these, uh, the vendors might be separate. The standard cell vendor is usually separate, then memory cell, even if the same vendor is providing the library. Uh, they will prefer to separate out these. They will give standard cell as one deliverable. They will give memory as another, I/O as another, PLLs as another. So your full chip STA link library list will be pretty long. So we will <coughs> set this. <coughs> so we set the search path and the link path. Then we read this file and link it. So it shows that it is loading so and so libraries. This information, removing 24 unneeded designs, uh, what it tells us is that uh, prime time to save on memory space, uh, it will load up the full chip or whatever, the complete netlist, and it will only uh, keep a limited information about the internal design. So you cannot change the current design. However, link has an option. So if you do a link minus help, link has an option. Keep sub designs so it will keep all the 100% design info after linking so that you can change to that particular design. But uh, this is not recommended uh, since uh, usually HP is carried out at the top level uh, of a particular block or a particular script. So it is recommended to do just link and let prime time remove some information related to the designs that are in the within the hierarchy. And it is not leading to any loss of information for you for all timing purposes. It is not leading to any loss of information. It saves on some memory plus, but the only thing is that it is it won't let you prime time will now won't let you change the current design to something else after you have built the top design, right? So this is the only disadvantage. So uh, this is the default behavior of link. It will remove the uh, unneeded designs. Uh, so it it does give some methods regarding to the uh, operating condition, but we will set the operating operating condition separately. Now the important command here is uh, specific to post layout is reparasitic. So this is the command. Uh, so we will read, we tell what is the format, and we will read this test, uh, which is for this design. Uh, and now uh, it will give some message about some information. And if there are some errors, it will produce them here. It is very important to understand those errors. Uh, those are slightly. Uh, so those errors would be related to whether it is not able to find any net which is given in the search but not in the netlist, or there might be cases where the net in the in the netlist don't have any uh, corresponding nets in the set. So it will give errors regarding that uh, those uh, nets. So if a net, if an extra net is present, so if any such mismatch occurs, it means that the netlist on which the netlist that you have and the set that is extracted. Has some mismatches, and most probably the netlist you have or one of these steps needs to be updated. So, so the backend uh, lead who is giving you this step, uh, or if you are the backend engineer, if you have a mismatch, then you need to make sure that 
this you are taking the same netlist which you use to do the export. It is very necessary to do that. If you see errors like missing net in one of the netlist or this one. Now, if there is some extra net in this pair, fine, it will give an error. But if, if there is some some nets which are not present in this pair, then prime time will use while loop model to so by default. When after you read parasitics, if prime time is not able to find any RNC for a particular net in this pair, it will complete it using while loop model, and it is not recommended because. You are working at a post layout stage, and you should resolve all the errors before finding. Right? So it tells us there are zero errors. How many annotated nets? That means these these same number of nets have resistance present in the pair, and they are annotated. Capacitance. So these are the total annotated nets. These are the capacitances and resistances. So each net can have multiple caps, multiple nodes, and different resistances. So uh, it says that there are uh, the coupling capacitance is zero. Uh, we will look at uh, if I am able to find. And let okay, let's do one thing. We will do remove annotated parasitic. So remove annotated parasitic will remove uh, whatever annotation. So this process is called annotation. So we could do remove annotated parasitic minus all. We will read the parasitics again. But let's look at the help first for this read parasitics. It's a very expensive command. So the important things here are that. This completes the completion time. This tells us that tells time time that if you do not find any nets in this pair, complete with either zero or while loop model. That means apply a while loop model or don't apply anything. Uh, Lumped cap. If you are reading spec, you should not use this option. Pin cap included. This tells by PT that uh, the RC network includes the pin capacitances. In most of the cases, the RC network inside spec will not include pin cap resistances. Pin cap will come from the library itself. Increment is something where uh, you are uh, reading uh, multiple spec files or hierarchical spec files. Then you have to use increment. Path prefix increment uh, are used to uh, when you are when you are reading. So, for example, a chip level. Has multiple blocks, and each let's say if it has five blocks, and all five blocks have been laid out separately, so there will be separate steps. So you will use minus increment and minus path option to annotate the step at a particular instance path. Uh, and uh, this is important. Keep cap capacitive coupling. Uh, let's try out keep capacitive coupling. Is like for uh, if the step has capacitive coupling, and you want to do uh, signal integrity. Noise analysis. Then you have to turn this option on. Let's see if it gives something. Okay, it tells us that annotated coupling capacitance is zero. That means although we gave keep coupling cap keep capacitor coupling, but it tells us that annotated coupling capacitance is zero. That means it does not have any coupling data, and uh, we will not be able to do noise analysis on this circuit. So a very useful command is report after you read in this parasitics. A very useful command is report annotated parasitics. Uh, the help uh, it will uh, so it tells us it gives the summary report of what is annotated and what what is not. So you can do a lot of uh, you can do it on a particular net. Uh, you can do it for internal net, boundary net, driverless net, loadless net. There are so many options. Let's just do the default thing. So it will give. Uh, Certain uh, messages. So even if so, there was no error reading the parasitic. This is the first case. So fine, all the uh, so there is no mismatch in terms of the nets and pin names between the stuff and the network. That is true. But now it is saying that uh, there are some RC annotations that are incomplete, right? And in the in the summary, we can see that so there are two types of nets: internal nets and boundary nets. Internal nets are pin to pin. Boundary nets are those are coming from ports. So this pin to pin not annotated zero. The first the first one is very important. RC network for all internal nets is completed, not annotated zero. So there is no problem here. Good. Now it comes to driverless nets. Now usually driverless nets uh, the nets are without drivers, so they are kind of hanging nets. Usually, any any problem here, not annotated 24, is usually okay to have. It's not a serious issue because that net is not driving anything. 
Loadless net again, uh, it is correct here, not annotated is zero. Boundary, there, there might be some problems like this. So, 71 are not annotated for boundary port net, and you might need to debug it. You might need to debug with the backend engineer, or if you yourself have a backend engineer, you might need to debug why the port nets are not annotating. So, many times uh, the port nets are uh, usually lumped into some value, the application is lumped into some value. Many times, if there are pads involved, then such cases can occur. So, it depends on case to case basis. But as a, an ST engineer, the, this is the most important thing. Internal network should be completely annotated. Now, although it is giving some uh, messages here that uh, ignoring the incomplete, so for example, if you tap this, driver pin is missing in the RC annotation for this particular network. So, it might happen that uh, this there is nothing which is driving this. Uh, let's look at uh, so for a particular message, you can look at what it means by doing a man on this. So it tells me uh, so it tells us that you receive this message, informs you that RC network on a specified net is ignored because it is incomplete. The specified pin is not physically connected to RC annotation. So uh, you have probably have to debug this and make sure that it's okay to move. So, there are many errors and warnings that uh, you can wait, but only after careful checking, right. So, we have now read the parasitics. So, now we are not working at a valid model level, we are working at an RC level. Now, we set the operating condition, and now this is very important on chip variation. We will set it to on chip variation. Analysis type is on chip variation. And we have this is the operating condition. So this is the 130 nanometer library, which probably explains why there is no coupling capacitance. Uh, it might be negligible. So this is uh, the uh, worst case operating condition. And now we, have, we will be working at a worst case uh, in the worst case form because we have read the uh, all the max dBs. So correspondingly, there will be min dBs for min form. Now we will create clocks. We will create some clocks. So there are now uh, Three clocks here, sys clock, p clock, and SDR clock. We will create each of these clock. So now we are up to constraints. So we will create this clock. I have assigned some periods. I am not sure what the specification of this chip is. I have just assigned some periods myself. Sys clock, p clock, and SDR clock. Now there are three clocks. Here. Now there is also a generated clock that we need to define. Uh, the generated clock is at the output of a so. Uh, let us go at the syntax. This is a generated clock. I have given a name. I have seen multiply by 2 uh, because this is what the, what the spec, what I understood from the necklace. This is the source. So, this particular block ICLK mul is a clock multiplier. And I have seen from the necklace that at this input, it gets this clock, and output is this, this multiplier's clock 2x thing. Okay. So I'll I'll show you in the netlist. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll create a multiply by clock, multiply by two clock at this output, and the source I am giving as this. I can even give source as this because this is the clock that reaches there. So you can give source can be any pin before the generation clock, generated clock creation point. So source can be before any pin before this in the panel network. So I'm creating this clock now. So now I've created all the clocks. Now, uh, the next is that you should specify what is the clock relationship between the clocks among all the clocks. Now, in this case, what I have learned from the netlist or what I have seen from the earlier panel reports I saw is that these three clocks are not synchronous to each other. Anyway, let us assume for once, uh, let us not assume anything. So, we will not give any false clocks, right. Now, let us say you are you are driving uh, you are writing the constraints and you know that these are the frequencies so pin five and twelve and now you uh, don't assume that they are either false they are either asynchronous or synchronous. However, one thing is clear that the periods for five and fifteen yes the periods are some simple multiple, but for five and twelve it's not a simple multiple. Even for twelve and fifteen it's not a simple multiple. So one thing you can deduce from the frequency itself, 
whether they are synchronous or asynchronous. Secondly, you can see whether uh, what source they might be coming from. So typically, if at a chip level you're working at a chip level, and at a chip level, if two clocks are coming from the outside world, most probably they will be asynchronous. Why? Because uh, since the routing uh, resources, people want to limit it. Engineers want to limit the routing resources, especially for high frequency signals like clock. Any, uh, there is no reason. Uh, in most of the cases, there is no reason to provide two synchronous clock at the chip level, or even at a block in a layout block level. If it's not absolute density, if the two clocks are coming from two separate PLLs, does not depend what period they have. They should be declared as asynchronous. Now, let's say we want to. The other case is of the generated clock. Now, this generated clock is generated from sys clock. Sys clock two x is generated from sys clock because this is uh, uh, this pin gets sys clock. So uh, now let's what let's do a simple update timing for. Uh, okay, let's uh, not do uh, not apply any false path. And let's proceed now. So uh, let's not apply the false class for now. We will apply clock uncertainty. And now clock uncertainty here will be a much lower value. Earlier we used to say 0 0.3, 0 0.5. Now I've set it to be 0.1. But it should be a lower value than PLR because now the clock network is in place. It will calculate all the delays. The skews will be real. The only thing which will be part of clock uncertainty will be most probably clock data and nothing else. Or some margin if you want to have. So I apply clock uncertainty. Very important, giving the propagated clocks. Set of clock or we will set all clocks to propagated mode. Only then time time will calculate all the actual latency, all the actual network delay. And then uh, I'll group paths. This I find it very useful to group the input output path group into separate to make sure I have different groups for input group and different clock path group for the output group. Then I will enable this. I will enable the CRPR pessimism removal by setting this as time and remove clock returning pessimism to true. I'll enable this. If not, it will not give me CRPR credit. We'll see how that happens. Then I'll set the timing delay. Now this is a worst case strategy, although I should ideally set the timing delay, the late timing delay to one, but I'll set it to just 1.1 just to show you what effect does it have. So I will set the timing rates, and then uh, that's it. So what is special for post layout? Timing rate, CR turning CRPR on, propagating the clock, reading the parasitics, setting it to OCV. So these are the important things. You read the actual parasitics by doing set propagated clock. You are posting prime time to calculate the all the proper latencies. By applying timing rates and setting the chip to OCD, setting the operating condition analysis mode to OCD, you are making sure that you are accounting for, for the on chip variation for the physical effect. CRPR, you are uh, making sure that unnecessary precedence does not harm your parts. In the uh, clock uncertainty, you have to adjust for, you don't have to now estimate the uh, clock skew. Clock skew would be real, calculated, so you need to reduce this value. Now we will do update timing. Now update timing will give a lot of messages. Many would be uh, for uh, some drive resistance is being too low, and uh, so prime time has adjusted the drive resistance to improve accuracy. First type of messages are okay; they are not harmful. Next is very important when it gives this PT016 kind of messages. Now, uh, if you remember, we discussed about the uh, if you have two clocks of different frequencies, how does prime time calculate the setup and hold it? Now, in uh, the first rule was that it will expand the uh, analysis time period to the LCM of the two clocks concerned. So now, the LCM for each uh, we have, we will do report clock. Now, see, we have P clock. SDR clock, sys clock, and now we have sys clock 2x. So we gave, we told time time to create sys clock. So the second part of the report is about the generated clock. 
we told prime time to create a generated block and we gave this as a master source and this is a generated source so prime time has determined that this is this clock is reaching this and uh, the waveform is multiplied by 2 now let's say if this token had multiple clocks reaching it which can be possible which is possible then you should also give master clock source as an extra argument to create the clock ideally you only give to need to give name master source generated source that's it but if the master source has multiple clocks then prime time will not know which clock to use as a master clock so then you also need to specify otherwise it's fine otherwise it's okay to give only master source and generated source so you can uh, know more about it by looking at pre generated clocks minus help so you have a master pin which is compulsory to give source and then a uh, master clock clock is essential if multiple clocks are present in the master pin so it has other options also edges what we discussed again multiply by divide by so you can read more about it there are so many options of you can there are, in many cases we have complex generated clocks so this this generated clock command is very powerful uh, it will handle almost all the cases now so uh, now we have three clocks one period is 5 other is 12 other is 15 so it will expand each clock to the lcm of these three or these four other and the lcm of all these is 60 so it will expand it to 60 now assume if one clock had a period like 33 or 17 the lcm will be still greater so you have to look for this message these messages in update timing expanding clock if the clock expansion period here is too large then you have a problem right now what i do i simply do now we did uh, we loaded the parasitics we saw how to make sure that parasitics are okay by doing report on the parasitic and looking out for error messages uh, we saw how to create multiple clock how to create a generated clock now let's do a report uh timing and i'll just do a report time minus no space so this will give me so just to uh, repeat this would give me the worst path for each path group one worst path among each all among all the path groups so this is uh, what it gave me uh let's do let's output it uh, into some report and then look at that report now uh this is a setup report obviously it's an i didn't did not give anything for the default setup report path group acing default acing default is for recovery removal so it's showing me that now see this is where the problem occurred now we see that uh, now uh, uh, since there is no uh, there is no we haven't defined any asynchronous relationship between the clocks so all the clocks are considered to be synchronous so now it will decide on edges now this is an assignment for you that you know that sys clock period is 15 uh sys clock period is 15 sdr clock period is 12 now you have to convince yourself why did the setup edge is why is the setup edge 45 and 45 remember you have to examine all the setup edges within the lcm period which is 60 so one thing is clear uh, what uh, an experienced person could tell you to me is that okay period 12 period 15 that means uh, so see you have to also see that what is the launch flow launch is this capture it as we are launch is six launch is 15 capture it as we are so down the lcm it will happen down the period it will happen that some sdr clock edge so first uh, uh, it will be the rise will be at both rise are at zero now in this case i haven't specified any base form so for both the rise it at zero for this the rise is edge is at zero the capture is at 7.5 for this the rise is at zero capture is at 6 right since the base form is similar in the sense they have zero rise the period difference is 3 So at some point of time during the complete lcm period, it will happen that the uh, this clock, if this is the capture clock, will capture after 
a period difference of whatever is the period difference. So here you see the difference is three, and here if we see six clock forty five, SDR clock forty eight, the difference is two. So it will happen. For hold, if you do not give any specify any waveform, and since the edges are coming at zero zero, the checking will always be performed at zero zero in most of the cases. So, but do, don't take my word for it. Draw the waveform on the paper yourself. Convince yourself that. If the sys clock is launching and if the clock is capturing, if prime time has done a correct correct job of doing 45 and 48, second important thing, clock network delay propagated. Clock network delay propagated is the sum of it is the total clock latency that prime time is calculating. So it is giving a propagated figure. It will give just a figure here if you don't give any option and report me. So 45 is the rise edge plus 3.09 is the propagated plus this we already know uh, clock to queue delay. Uh, I'll expand this report timing each and every time. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you the major figures here: clock network delay propagated. These are again gate delays. Then the capture edge. Again, it will be clock network delay propagated. Now see, this is the skew. 3.09 is the propagated delay for this clock. 1.96 is the proper propagated delay for SDR clock. There is a two difference, and this is where the clock relationships are very very important. Now, clock three network needs to know whether two clocks are synchronous. If the two clocks are clocks are synchronous to each other, it will build a common clock three because it needs to balance the skew across. So, skew balancing is needed for all the parts which interact with each, with each other. If the two clocks are synchronous, then there will be timing pass between them, and the clock three synthesis algorithm will consider that and build a common clock three. And so the skews will be within some particular strict limit. If in the back end the two clocks are deemed as asynchronous, then there will be independent clock phase, and, and their skews will not match. So if in back end, if in clock three synthesis. Two clocks are deemed to be asynchronous, but in STA you are calling them synchronous. Then it's a problem. The skews will not match, right? Now here we see that uh, we see that that there is okay. There is a clock that has been propagated, and this is the proper skew: three point zero nine minus one point nine six. Clock reconversion pessimism is zero. Why is zero? Because there is no common clock path. I'll, I'll explain this further, but here is zero. CRPR is zero. This is also one indication. Now, one indication that these clocks are asynchronous. Now, see, as an FT engineer, obviously this will not be the case for people working in industry. When I started on this lab, I did not know anything about the clock. I just decided some arbitrary clock period, and I did not know whether these clocks are asynchronous to each other. So I decided not to assume anything. I did not set any false start. But now I see that. First indication: skew is mismatch. Three and one, one point nine six. There's a big difference. One nanosecond is a big, big skew. One indication that they are not not synchronous. Second indication: there is no common path. These are both are coming from primary port. So there is second indication that they are asynchronous people. Let's see other reports. Uh, then here it's a sys clock and sys clock. So here it's good. Sys clock to sys clock. So now we see good. This is an example of a half cycle path where the launch clock or latch is working on a negative edge. So now usually when a path is launched by sys clock, captured by sys clock, usually it will be full period long, zero and fifteen. But here the launch point is the negative level sensitive latch. Now since it's negative. The launch active edge here is the fall edge, so this is the fall edge. This is the rise edge capture edge. So now you get a period of seven point five. See here the CRPR has some value. So it is delaying CRPR removal is delaying the capture clock. When you delay the capture clock in case of setup, it is an advantage. So CRPR is a pessimist removal. It is not a pessimist addition. 
It means if you don't do CRPR analysis, that means extra unneeded pessimism is added to your flow. CRPR is a process which removes this pessimism, so it will credit to the slack, right? So this is one example. Let's go further. This is an input group. It is assuming some zero input input delay because we haven't specified any input delay. Now here also, uh, in case of multi-block till clock, now you cannot give single input delay with respect to one single clock to all the inputs. You have to know design wise which inputs talk to which clocks. For example, here this report without even giving any input delay, this report tells me that there is a path between SB this pin and this clock domain. So I know that yes, this pin SD DQ pin should be given some input delay with respect to SDR clock, not any other clock. Assuming if let's say SDR is asynchronous to all other clock, then I should be very careful. Now let's say you have you are working at a chip, some of the inputs go to memory controller, other inputs go to CPU. Now you should not assign input delay on memory controller ports with respect to the CPU clock. You should restrict the domain. Assign input delay on the memory controller port with respect to the memory controller clock. This is what here we have to do. SD pins are the name suggests they are related to some SDR interface, memory interface. SDR clock is again a memory clock. So these pins should be assigned input delay with respect to SDR clock only, not with respect to any other clock. So things become a bit more complex, a bit more detailed when you go to when you have multiple clocks, right? So you have to be careful. Now no, so we have applied clock uncertainty to all the clocks, uh, which is it's getting subtracted here, and uh, rest all you are already already familiar. Let's move ahead. Again, we see the path from SDR clock to PQ. Now here the problem is that we are only getting again the skew mismatch here: 2.85, 1.97, one evidence, second evidence. Both of them are coming from. The ports, so they have no common clock, uh, common uh, logic, clock logic. So CRPR is zero. CRPR, I again repeat, clock reconversion specific removal can only happen if you have a common clock uh, path between launch and capture, capture edges. So here also, since both the clocks are coming from primary ports, there is no common path. So CRPR is zero. The report timing report also tells us what are what are the debates. And now, with the present clock frequency, we see that the launch edge is 24, capture is 25. Something wrong. There is one nanosecond difference. 130 nanometer logic cannot work at 1 gigahertz. So, it, it appears that SDR and P clock are again uh, asynchronous to each other. So, again, you, you have some strange relationships 22.5 and 24. So, if you don't declare your if you have such periods and if your spec actually says that your clock should be asynchronous to each other and if you don't declare it as such, you will have a lot of strange timing reports to them, like this launch, launch at 22.5 capture at 20. These are strange numbers, right? Uh, as my experience says. So, what I'll do, I'll clean up this, uh, but as an assignment, uh, just do one exercise that uh, assume the two clocks to be one clock to be uh, 15, other clock to be 12, and uh, give me what are the tell me what are the uh, launch and capture edges. You the answer is here, you have to just make sure that you understand it. So, in this case, it's 45 and 48 in case of setup. Remember, here the launch is this, capture is the R, launch is 15, capture is 12. Let's see. So uh, let me go to the specific case now from get clocks, sys clock, minus two clocks, SDR. This is how I do specific report timing. And again, 45 and 48 is okay. I'll add minus no split to make it clear. Right. Now, see, when I did this, there are two, two timing reports here. One is the async default. So async default, since it's a different group than the clock group, so it will give me again it, any report timing command. Uh, 
it will try to give me whatever path group is satisfied for each path group it will give me the work block. So, in this case the capture clock is SDR clock, but uh, here also for the async default also the capture clock is SDR clock, but since it is a recovery removal type of check it is grouped under async default so it will give me the async default report plus it will also give me the what regular H2 report. So, 45 to 40 to ok now let us make things more interesting I will now report the whole time. I will say whole time how do you report you say delay type min. Now, here is 0 and 0 which is what I told you always if the two clocks you do not give any waveform numbers it will assume the rise is 0 and if you do not have asynchronous relationship if you do not define false path then the whole edges in all probability would be 0 and 0. You can verify this by again drawing it in your on your on a paper draw the waveforms. Uh, make sure you understand how the edges are calculated. I can you can do the other way around also now. Let us say minus 2 and minus delay min is ok 30 30 30 30 is same as 0 0 no difference. Uh, uh, but here uh, so you, so see here it is uh, 0 0 here is 30 30. So, so uh, 0 0 is exactly same as 30 30 it is no difference from so sometimes prime time will go to the so he is saying 30 30 here why because there is a fall edge. So, there is a fall edge here and uh, there is a rise edge and uh, why this is a fall edge because it uh, it has some falling edge figure flip flop in, in somewhere which is launching the data. So, it will give uh, the fall edge and it will uh, because the fall edge is at 30 the capture is at arise is at 30 for for whole. So, it is so 0 0 is same as 30 30 uh, prime time will shift the edges when it when when it comes to negative edges right for whole. So, understand this between both these clock to and from I will again give the setup to. So, now see it is 12 and 15. Now, this is very clear if you draw a figure this will become very clear because now the launch in SDR capture is this. The SDR uh, rise it comes at 0 then again at 12 for 6 clock the rise comes at 0 the capture comes at 15. If for the capture clock the capture edge is coming at 15 the rise edge is coming at 0 and 15. So, at the 15 the launch edge of the launch the launch clocks launch edge just before this is 12. So, it is 12 and 15. Similarly, you will see that how it is 45 and 48 when you Turn the when you do I for seven, you launch from it and capture from it here. So as an assignment, draw the waveform on a paper for both these clock. As you one clock to be launched, other clock to be captured. Do it for both the cases, switch the clock then, and make sure that you understand what are the launch edges, what are the capture for both setup and hold. Do the exercise and make sure that you understand it completely. If you don't understand it, go back to the lecture slides in which we discuss this concept. Read the man page, read the documentation, and make yourself very comfortable with it. Right now, I'll do the actual stuff. Now I have seen that there are evidences that these clocks are asynchronous to each other. Now I will apply all forms. Now, since I am not doing noise analysis, I can uh, use false paths to, to declare my clock relationships. It is all right uh, to do this if you are not doing noise analysis. Now, one thing you have to be careful is that in this design. 6 clock and 6 clock 2 x are not asynchronous. 6 clock 2 x is multiplied by 2 of this clock. So, you should not by mistake set a false path between these two. So, what how I do it? I do something like this. There are many ways to declare false paths uh, between uh, a group of clocks. Many people will write some typical procedures, uh, many people will uh, do some more sophisticated, but we will do very basic stuff here. We will just do you will do not write any procedure, we will write the clock names itself. So, here I say minus from the clock list sys clock and sys clock to it. I am grouping them in the same list because they two are they should not be set, set false path with respect to each other. So, now prime time will apply false paths from sys clock and sys clock to x to p clock and SDR clock. Now, secondly, I should do p clock to this group. So, so 
then i do from p clock i do from p clock from p clock to sys clock sys clock to x and p clock i do like this then i do the last case which is from sdr clock to sys clock sys clock to s and p clock these three statements make sure that sys clock and sys clock to x are synchronous from this group uh, between this group and p clock they are asynchronous between this group and sdr clock they are asynchronous sdr is asynchronous to p so these three commands will make sure that you have proper clock relationship defined any change in constraints i have to do update timing even if i don't do it the next command i run run will force it so i do update timing now see prime time is giving me one information now one information of about pt 016 it is the code pt 016 it is expanding sys clock to x now let's report clocks let's do report clocks again sys clock to x period is 7.5 sys clock period is 15 both of them are synchronous that is why Prime time needs to expand the period of this clock to x to 15. The LCM of these two, 15 and 7.5, is 15. It's a typical case of master clock and a multiply by two, or a master clock and a divide by two. It's a typical case, right? Now uh, my constraints are good enough, except input and output delay. Now let's look deeply into what all options does report timing have. Let's understand. our crpr works let's do some clock analysis let's do what an st engineer will do during uh, the process of making sure that this constraints are correct everything is correct right and later we will come to uh, the point now this is so to this analysis this session last session will focus on how to debug stuff how to understand timing reports and make sure that the constraints you have specified the rates you have set and everything is is in place it is correct and the second part the later in extension of this is now you analyze violations and you try and fix them as an st engineer the job is also to help fix the violation right so we we'll look into that later probably in this lab or in the next one also now there is a very uh, in the, uh, interesting command called report clock uh, timing report clock timing uh, helps us in analyzing a particular clock in terms of its latency and speed now it has lot of options it has almost a uh, lot of options which are, which are common to uh, report timing why because they are from and to and set up and all and so on so one example i'll show you uh, i'll say report clock timing uh, is there a minus clock option uh, So yeah, it has a minus clock option. Otherwise, it will do for most, more, all the clocks. So let's do it for one clock. Board. Let's do it for PCLK, and the compulsory option is minus type. Now it's asking you what. So let's give minus type skew. Uh, and report clock timing minus clock PCLK type skew. Now uh, it will tell us. now okay uh, now there will be a bunch of registers driven by this clock so uh, what we could do is we can say how do i know this i can do all registers minus clock p clock now this way uh, this is a command you can write to list down all the registers that are driven by p clock so now among all these registers so i'll give you one more interesting uh, command it's called size of collection So now let's say I want to know the number. Looks like the session is frozen. Yeah. So uh, before clock timing minus, so I'll I was showing you an interesting command uh, which is. So all uh, registers minus clock uh, clock PCLK will give you a list of all the registers. Clock you can 
any any command that returns a collection in tickle you can do a size of collection on it and uh, it will give you the number so there are 1076 registers on register p clock now this command report clock timing minus clock clock name and type skew gives us among these 1076 and uh, clocks it will give us the clock that has the best latency and give us the clock that has the worst latency so this block here has the best latency of two, worst latency of 2.86. This block, this clock here, the clock pin of this clock has a best latency of 1.89. This is the CRPR among these two because there will be a there will be a common clock period. Although there might not be a path between these two, there might and might not be a path between these two, but it will show you the latency. It will show you the CRPR and the skew. Skew is the difference, so the difference adjusted by the value of CRP. Here it will tell what is the edge, whether it's rise, so it's rise, rise, uh, P means clock, clock is propagated, and minus plus are just like uh, what is the rise edge, what is the launch, and what is the capture edge. Now, so this can, this with this command, you can analyze the quality of the clock. Tree. You can also say minus type latency. Uh, and now it will give the it will give only right now it's giving only one clock with a particular uh, uh, so it will be uh, it will be the same clock uh, it is giving the latency to be total latency to be 2.89 or transition ipc i core yeah okay it is giving us some clock and it is giving latency value now you can give uh, okay, so no, no, no. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll explain it again because I I had explained it strongly in terms of skew. Let's analyze latency first. Forget about skew. I'll correct on the skew part. On the skew part, if you give minus max, sorry, minus inverse to be let's say 50, and I'll give minus no skew. So among all the 1076 uh, clock points, it will list down the latency in the Decreasing order. The 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 clock with the worst latency figure will come at the top, and it will keep on decreasing. So we see that these are the list of clocks that have 2.89 latency. Everything is 2.89. We can increase the significant digit to let's say three, and we see that this is okay. It's the same as we can even do let's say 100, 100, and so it it tells us that okay, it shows us that in decreasing order of in decreasing latency. So it also tells us what is the transition, uh, the source latency, which is zero for everything. Uh, we have, I haven't specified any uh, source latency. Then this is the, uh, uh, I think this is the uh, rise latency. This is the fall latency. Okay, yeah. This is the rise edge, or or this is the fall edge. This is the rise edge. So minus plus, I guess, means that fall and rise. And yeah. So this is the fall. This is the rise. Now skew is different. It's skew. Uh, that's what. Okay. Let's do skew again. Now, among all these, now among all the timing paths on this particular clock, it will give which timing path has the worst skew. That's why the CRPR appears there. It tells us that this path has the worst skew. Uh, now, this, 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 these two endpoints might not have the worst latency or the best latency, but among all the timing paths. These particular two particular clocks have the worst skew. So there will be a timing path from either from this to this or from this to this. And this is the worst worst latency, uh, I mean the worst skew. Uh, the skew number is calculated as a difference of these two adjusted by the CRPI value. So this is the skew. So see the actual skew number. So skew matters only when there is a timing path. First important, okay. First important thing, the clock tree synthesis tool will try and match the clock latency figure for all the clocks on the clock tree. Let's say for this clock has 1076 clock, it will try to match these two numbers, it will try to match latency in fact, it will try to keep a latency in a, within a tight range for all these 1076. Skew is the difference between the, the clock latencies of any two clocks. But there should be a timing path between these two clocks. Not all clocks will have timing paths with all, right? 
that some flops will not have timing paths to other flops. So this Q number here, minus type Q, gives you the worst Q number. And actual clock Q is always CRPR adjusted. If you take the value without CRPR, the Q is 2.86 minus 1.89. Q is about one nanosecond. But the Q has to be adjusted by the CRPR value, otherwise it's not a real Q because of the delays. Because in the common clock path, uh, in the same path, is treated is the same cells are being treated taken as max delay in one case and mild delay in another case. They have two separate delays, which is not possible physically. That is why actual skew number is 0.27, which is good for this clock. The actual skew number is 0.27. You can change the clock here. You can do this clock, and the skew here is 1.34. This is bad. Now this might also happen because of there is so if there is some generated clock logic now. Consider that uh, a clock has a generated clock logic on it, so there will be the master clock and there is some generated clock on it, and there is a, another cloud of logic. Now, for any generated clock logic, CTS will not will keep the generated clock logic out of the skew point. It will not balance. Why? Because the generated clock logic will not have regular timing paths. A, a flop divider, for example. Will not have any regular data path, so it does not need to be. It does not need a. Usually, if there is a generated clock and if it's balanced, if a flop that is generating a clock, and if it's balanced with the rest of that group, it will have a very big latency. And always, we want to keep the clock latency to lower. The lower the clock latency, the better is the timing because of the OCD effect. You have to understand this. Consider this. Uh, uh, give some thought on this. The larger the clock latency means the larger the delay from the clock definition point to the flops. The larger the clock latency, the larger portion of the clock tree will be non-common. Increasing the non-common clock tree part will affect your timing, negatively affect your timing. So, all the tools will try to keep lower and lower latency. So, a flop that is generating a clock from a master clock, it's a clock divider. Need not be balanced with the rest of the logic. In such a such, such cases, you can see some some skew numbers. So skew numbers are just a measure of the clock tree. They are not a measure of the timing. We will see timing afterwards. So this is the command report clock timing, which you can use to analyze the clock tree. This is not a very famous uh, command. This is not a very highly used command, but you should understand that. Uh, such a command exists, and you can port some few numbers and some latency numbers using this. We use this uh, uh, command for a very specific case. Uh, when you go to industry, you might find some application that requires the use of this command. Now, there is one more uh, uh, command. We we have already seen this command check timing. Now let's run check timing here. So check timing is a, is a very useful command. So if let's say you forgot to define some clock, check timing will tell. You. It will tell here that there are some clocks which have no clock. I'll show you a check timing report, a verbose report, which is without clocks. I haven't defined any clocks for a particular design. So this is the kind of report it gives. It tells me there are unconstrained endpoints. Unconstrained endpoints are because of the clock being absent. Plus, it will uh, give me a list of. This is a check timing verbose report. It will also give me a list of registers with no clock. These registers don't get clock. Checking no clock. It gives the number and a list of registers that don't have clock. So it also is an expandable clock. That means if you have uh, clocks with weird periods and they are not, uh, if the LCM is pretty big, or if the generated clock does not is not connected to the master clock in the network system, or there is some difference between the generated clock definition and the network structure, then it will give an expandable clock. That means that it is not able to an expandable means. It is not able to find out the period of the generated clock, so it will give warnings here. So this is a very, it will give combination loops warning here. It will give generated clock with the other warnings here. So uh, you need to make sure that check timing report is clean. You understand all the warnings here before proceeding to the timing reports. Now let's look at report timing. Now I will do again do report timing and do minus no split. So again, it will give me a lot of things. Now let's analyze one only one particular timing report uh, and look it into it in, into detail what it all it has. Let's look at just 
Now this clock gives me this particular report. So we've already seen. Uh, so we now keep expanding the. Uh, now here, important point. So the first path here is launched by sys clock two x, not by sys clock. It is launched by sys clock two x. It is captured by sys clock. Now please note that a particular clock can get multiple clocks due to some some reason. There can be many reasons. Now let's uh, first analyze. So how do you see? Uh, how do you see that a clock gets multiple clocks? I will tell you about the. We can know this by uh, doing a check timing. So check timing by default has an include list and a. So it has a, multi, uh, a multiple clock option also. Uh, so yeah. So by default it doesn't check. Let's try and include this minus include multiple clocks. So it will check. So it's telling me that timing is enabled multiple clocks per register set to true. So if you set this variable to false, then prime time will give warnings when registers have multiple clocks. But right now it's set to true. Actually, it is possible in static timing analysis. Uh, it is very possible. It is used also that multiple clocks uh, can reach particular register. So now let's say there are. Two different clock sources which can reach a particular logic, and they are depending on on some box selection. Now, uh, as an amateur, you might choose to to set some case analysis on this box and uh, propagate only one clock at a time. But as you become more experienced, you realize that you don't set any case analysis on this particular selection. You let both the clocks through, and so you can analyze both the clocks at the same time. There is no harm in doing that. It's actually SP allows you to do, do that. So that is why this variable is set to true. So we will uh, we will see this. We will debug this later. Let's look at the report timing again. So now see this that sys clock two x rise edge is seven point five. Call is that I mean capture is that sys clock capture is sys clock. It has fifteen. This is thirty. This is expected because sys clock is twice. It's multiple sys clock two x is a multiply by two of sys clock. So the edges are the period is expanded to 15 because the LCM is 15. For cases, you can again verify this on paper. Uh, for cases where you have launched from a clock and captured by a 2x clock, or the other way around, the period you get is equivalent to full cycle of the faster clock or half cycle of the slower clock. Both are same. In this case, the faster clock period is 7.5. The slower clock period is 15. So if you launch from one and capture at another, the total period you get will always be equal to one period of the faster clock. That is 7.5. You can verify this. You can verify this by making the the waveform. So here the launch is at 7.5, capture is at 15, which is expected. So any time you have a launch and a capture between two clocks that are either divided by two or multiplied by two, the period you get. Is one period of the faster clock. Here the faster clock is this clock two x. The period is seven point five. What is the difference here? Seven point five and fifteen. The difference is again seven point five. So this is a setup check. You can even do this the other way round. This clock. Let's see what is the worst part here. This clock two x. The worst part uh, is the from this clock to this clock two x. So again, zero and seven point five. So again, whether the, the launch is slower or launch is from faster, the period you get is one clock period of the faster clock. So here it's zero and seven point five. Okay. Now uh, let's explore a couple of op options in uh, in report timing. So I'll keep this report timing as it is. I will uh, I'll expand it further. Now there's a type, uh, there's a path type which is very useful. Now this path type is default. This path type is normal. You can have a summary. You can have a summary path like this, or uh, and you can add things to it. You can add input. You can add net. You can add transition. You can add capacitance. I'll add these and see. This is what now the timing report looks like. Let's. Uh, I've already explained this in one of the labs, but let me explain something. Fan out when you give nets. It will start giving fan out information also, so we'll know how and when it fan out. 
again it will report transition and capacitance. If you are doing pre layout, you will not notice this ampersand sign. This ampersand sign is only for post layout, it tells you that RNC is annotated for this and prime timing is doing delay calculation based on that. So, if you do not see ampersand at some point, it means that prime time is not is either doing wire load or not doing anything. So, you have to investigate that. So, you have to see. So, if you have made sure that you have no errors while reading parasitic, if you have made sure that your report has not been passed, you do not need to look for ampersand. But I am just telling you for information that ampersand means that this is an annotated delay or calculated delay from stuff. Okay. Then now it will also show inputs of every cell because we have enabled minus input things. Now clock network delay propagator. This is very important here. But still we see that path is starting from the clock pin of the launch clock. Here the launch clock is rising as trigger, this is the launch clock operand VREG, and path is starting from this. What about the launch clock clock? Launch clock path is compressed here, it is represented by a single statement clock network delay propagated. Let me open a CPU here, let's do So, uh, we see that actually the path should start from this, uh, the, the path should start from somewhere from here, clock launch path, it should show us the launch path, then data path and then the clock capture path. But here it is not showing me the clock launch path. Clock launch path is represented by just a single command, single statement, clock network will propagated. In case of pre layout, this comes as ideal because we set the clock to propagated mode, it is now propagated, it is showing me a complete just a single delay value. I will expand this further. Second thing, again, capture clock network delay is also propagated, compressed, there is no information. Clock uncertainty, CRPR is fine. Uh, now let us expand. So, now there is an option called we will remove capacitance in transition for a while, we will add minus path type full clock, this will show me the full clock path. Now see the report has length has increased. Now see it will start from the port, this is very important, now it starts from the port, it is now showing me the launch path as well, launch clock path, clock goes to pad shows me the incremental delay, shows me the cumulative delay, it goes to some clock mux logic, there is a C, there is a clock multiplier here, there is a clock multiplier, clock multiplier 1x, this is a, so every time it is showing the reference also, this cell is of type this buff d2, this cell is of type buff d2, this is a net, it is a, this cell is of type mux and so on. And it goes to something, it goes to OSIS 2x clock and then uh, so now uh, and then it reaches yeah then it reaches goes through some logic and reaches this. So, here 3.04 it reaches at 3.04. Now, the timing report starts from 0. In the earlier case, the timing report started from right from 3.04 because the latency was 3.04. So, by doing minus full clock, you can do some, you can expand the clock logic, you can see the actual launch path. Let me output it to uh, report and we will we'll see this. So, this is how you see the complete clock path. Right? It also tells us what, is, what are the options that we see. So, this is how you see the complete clock path. Uh, and uh, second, at the capture part, now also you see the now now here this is this, uh, this strange thing. Still, the clock source latency is coming out to be 0 0.98. 
In the launch part, the clock source latency is coming out to be zero, which is expected because it starts from the clock generation point. But at the capture part, since it's a generated clock, since clock Q is not a primary clock, it's a generated clock. So still, it did not give us the complete path for the generated clock. This is the generated clock latency. This is known as the generated clock latency. But it starts at the generated clock creation point, which is this. If this latency, generated clock latency is zero, then there is something wrong. If you have defined a generated clock and there is a clock generation logic, it should be timed. It should be correctly timed. Then only it's correct. If the figure here is zero, there is something wrong, and obviously you will get some check timing messages. You would also get messages during update time, but we did not get any messages. And we have a proper, we have some figure here, right? So it's correct. And then we also see the clock capture path as well. It also, uh, and uh, that's it, you know everything. Clock reaches the clock, clock pin here. There is a CRPR credit given to you, clock uncertainty, and so on, right? So this is now how do I see the generated clock network as well? There's an option called full clock expanded. So the types for summary, full clock and full clock, clock expanded. The one, the default thing where, where we see just the one figure, the, the propagated figure, is the full. So they are summary, full, full means full data path, full clock means full clock path, full clock path expanded means full clock along with generated clock report also. Now let's look at the timing report. The only thing that will change is for the generated clock. Now for the capture, it's again starts at zero. Now it starts at zero, it starts at the master clock again, which is same. Sys clock is same here. It goes to pad and, and then it tells us this is the G clock source. This is the generated clock source. This is how you see and make sure and verify that the generated clock latency is being calculated. You do report timing and this is where report timing is so powerful. It has so many options. It gives you so many options to report. So this is where we are getting the we got uh, generated how this is how prime time calculated generated clock latency right so what is the generated clock latency from here this time minus this time 8.48 minus 7.5 which is 0 0.98 which is what we saw earlier so now uh, it so since it shows the complete clock propagation it doesn't show a combined latency figure Right. It is not showing a summary latency figure here because we have used the expanded option. Now, uh, does it show common? Okay. Now let's talk about CRPI. Now let me re uh, report a simple report. I'll say minus group sys clock and from get clocks sys clock. Now this is where I am. Saying that report timing gives you a report, the launch, this clock, and the capture is also this clock. So the capture is controlled by the group option, launch can be from to this clock, that clock, this clock. Now, here I haven't done minus expanded, that's all right. Uh, I Now I see, okay, I see some figures here. I see that launch is at zero, capture is at 15, which is okay, and I see all the delays, fine. Now let's talk about CRP here. For hold, for setup, this is a setup report. Setup, it will give you the credit and move the capture edge to later point in time. Capture edge after network delay 17.63, it will add CRPR. It is giving you credit. Anything that moves your capture edge later in time for setup check is helping you. I do this for hold. CRPR value, it will move the capture edge back in time. Anything for hold, if it moves your clock capture edge back in time, it's helping you, it's giving you credit. If the CRPR was not there, this lag would have been worse by 0 0.19. Minus 0 0.87, minus 0 0.19. This would have been the slack, if not CRPR, if not because of CRPR. CRPR is reducing the slack by 0.19, right? So this is how you understand CRPR figures. Let's go back to setup report. Now let me uh, give you something else, report delay calculation. 
This is a report CRPR command. I can say report CRPR from now. CRPR is between clocks, so you can do this and to this. Any two launch and capture, you can do a report CRPR, and it will now tell you something. It will tell you first what is the common point, and does it also report the common point using something? So let me also. Uh, do a report timing and minus path type full clock and uh, yeah and I'll do a report CRPR. So this is the common point. This is the clock clock common point, which is I blender and buff BD G6 B2 IA. So we see that this is the common point. So in fact. The common point is right before the capture edge, and for the launch, this common point is this is the common point, and it diverges from here. So it is telling me that this is the common point, which is from this figure. This is the this is the common point we are talking about. The after 1.2 ns on the clock network, which this is the common clock path. It also tells me what is the launch edge at common point. What is the capture edge? Rising, rising, arrival time. Early late. Now this early and late arrival timing are only because of, mostly because of. It can be because of different paths also. But here we let's see the path. Here the path is going through a mass yeah. So it can be because of different path, or it can be because it's not because of different path because the common clock is the common path is common. It's unique. So it is because of the CRT. It is because of the delay values. We have given delay as 1.1 and 0.9. So it is telling me that. Let's only worry about the rise edge because uh, the launch and fall capital are both rising. It is doing it for both falls, rise and fall. So early is 2.29, late is 3.31. The actual delay is between these two values. So the actual delay is most probably early is 2.29. So what I'll do? I'll divide 2.29 by 0.9. So actual delay is 2.54. And uh, about 2.54, and 2.54 into 0.9 is the early delay, which is 2.29, and actual delay into 1.1 is the. Uh, it is strange 3.31. I have to see what is the. I have to double check. Uh, so early is 2.29 because it is deleted. Let me take the delete value. It's 1.1 and 0.9. Okay. So uh, it's 2.29 is the early. The late is 3.31, and uh, the CRPR the difference is 1.02, which is giving the edges match time, which has rise and rise edge, and CRPR value of 1.02 is given back to you. So this is how you debug CRPR numbers if you have to. Otherwise, if everything is going fine, then uh, so just make sure that whenever you are uh, worried about clock skew, you have to take into account CRPR value because. Clock skew, actual clock skew, the real clock skew is the reported clock skew adjusted by the CRPR value. Right. So, for example, in this report, particular report, you say that okay, clock network delay propagated is 2.63. This is 3.7. So the skew is more than one another, but the actual skew is that number adjusted by 1.02. So the actual actual skew is pretty good here in this case. So this is how you debug CRP. Now let's talk about the rate. I was talking about the rate. Let's come back to the rate. Report timing is an option where you can give minus the rate, and it will also start reporting the rate. So let me, yeah. So now it's telling me that we will let's give minus part, minus part, type full clock. And read it directly. So here we are given minus delay. Now it's also started showing me the delay number. Now I have given the late delay to be 1.1, so it will multiply all such timing. So this is already multiplied timing. It is showing me the delay. It multiplied all such. This is pre multi after multiplication. These delays are after multiplication. It multiplied the launch clock edge plus. It multiplied all the uh, the data 
parts by 1.1. So everything in the launch part in the first part of the report will be multiplied by 1.1. It's already multiplied. It's just showing you the multiplication factor. Everything in the capture is already multiplied by 0.9 because this is the early part. So remember, for setup, the launch clock path and the data path are taken as maximum. The capture clock path is taken as minimum. It's early. So this is early, right? And at the end, it also gives me a delayed report summary. Total delayed required time is 0.29, arrival time is minus 1.21. Total delayed slack is 1.51. That is telling us that the total delayed applied in the required time is 0.29 by multiplying it by 0.9. So all the figures, the delayed effect is 0.29 for the required edge for the capture edge. The delayed effect is 1.21 for the launch part. This delayed effect is more because the data path is bigger. Plus, it also has a launch clock path. The uh, the required time only has the clock capture path. That's why the delayed effect is less. Slack is 1.51. Slack with deleting applied is 5. CRPI due to deleting is minus 0.56. Slack with no derating, that means if there was no derating, if there was no derating, what would have been the slack? The slack is without derating is 5.9. That means, how did it come up with this number? 5.95. So, this is the total delay, this is the total slack derate. If the derate was not there, then CRPR would have been not there and the CRPR credit. Should be again adjusted. So 1.51 is the total delay that is applied. So this is minus shows its late delay in the arrival time. So total delay is 1.51 plus slack with deleting applied is 5 minus 5. Point, uh, so it will be something like this. Five minus zero point five six plus one point five one. So this is the slab without the delete. How do I achieve? I'll repeat again. Without with the delete, the slack is five. Now what are the delete applied? Delete is point two nine for uh, required. One point two one for arrival. Sum is one point five one. Add one point five one. This is the 1.51 is the time that the rate has consumed. 5 is the slack with the rates. So 1.5 is the, the time consumed by the rate. We add it. So slack would increase. But now the CRPR credit is given back to us because of the delay. If we don't apply the rate, the CRPR credit will be taken back. So I will subtract whatever CRPR is given. This is the way it arrives with a number. So this is the this is how you can also see the effect of the delay in report timing. Please remember, without delays, the OCV doesn't make sense, right? There has to be some delay to model the onset variation. So this is how we do it, right? And, and applying delays, setting the analysis condition as onset variation and CRPR, they all come under a single methodology of onset variation. So this is how you see the generated clock. This is how you see the generated clock expanded uh, report. You see the uh, the rates. You see the OCD. You see the uh, uh, you can do a report clock uh, report CRPR. You can do a minus direct option and see all the direct values there and so on. Right. So this is all the calculation about the report form. So we have. Uh, uh, now let's let's look at report delay calculation. Let's look at this report again. Uh, or, and now let's look at okay. First, look at the uh, delay min report. Okay, now we are looking at min, edges are 0 and 0. Now it changes for hold, for hold, 
the launch clock path and the data path are made to come early so they are multiplied by 0.9 for uh, capture part is delayed so it's 1.1 here it is showing me how much uh, slack was so this is violating by 0.87 it is showing me what is the effect of the rate here and it is adjusting using the same formula that we use for setup. It is showing us slack with no derating. So we see that the rating in both the cases of setup and hood it will make the path work. Right? Now you can uh, do something like uh, let's look at the timing report, a simple timing report. And let's do you can any at any point of uh, So uh, at any time, if you want to see how did the prime time calculate delay, you can do something like this: report delay calculation minus from any pin to any pin. Now let's say I am going from the input of a particular cell to the output of the same cell. Right? This is where I am asking prime time to tell me the delay calculation for the cell delay. So if I do this, then it is telling me that uh, let's again uh, redirect it. So this is I'm I'm now focusing on a particular cell from pin. So it is telling me the units. It is telling me which library it comes from. It is telling me which cell we are talking about. We are talking about an adder cell between the carry in and carry out. It is telling me it's a positive unit. So it's telling me for the positive unit first. It is telling me the RC network. So it is telling me the number of uh, elements on CO, RC, caps, and two resistances. So it will add the total cap. This total capacitance is the pin cap plus the whatever cap it sees from the RC network. Total resistance. Then here it is telling me what is the input transition time, what is the effective cap, uh, what is the drive resistance, what is the output transition time, and the cell delay. This is where it calculates. So it will not show you the actual algorithm and formula it uses obviously is proprietary, but it will show you what is the input transition value, what is the output transition value for this particular cell. It will now show you for the uh, so for all the it will show you from input to output, it will show you for all the timing types that are defined in the library. So for here, for example, the first path is uh, it is telling that RC delay calculation is still because the RC delay calculation was not used for driving or fine. We are more focused on the cell delay here. So first one is uh, uh, from to this arc sense is positive in it. Now it is telling us that uh, here there is a condition positive unit, but the condition is A1 and B0. So it will give us for all the conditions. This is the condition A0 and B1. So for Whatever data is defined in the library dot lib, using that data, so there can be a, a conditional data also, timing type uh, depending on the when condition, on some input conditions, you can define the delay. For all such conditions, it will output the delay calculation. Now I can also do delay calculation for a particular net. Let's try that. Let's again look at the timing report and let's do now delay calculation minus from the output of a particular cell to the input of another cell. Now here, uh, I am not sure what this message is, but because the RC delay calculation is not used, this is, I am not sure what this message is, but looks like there is some delay calculation because there are some, there are some caps uh, and resistances, so it will tell what is the net delay, what is the transition time, from pin transition time, to pin transition time and so on. Because this is now no, no, we are not asking about the the arc type is net it is not cell right so it is telling me what is the RC network it is telling me uh, this message might be related to the CCS model I guess we are using the MLDM model so that's all right uh, so it is it is so for any section of the uh, circuit of the design you can do a delay calculation by using the report delay calculation. Now let's uh, look at uh, one more option in report timing called report timing. Let's, let's look at all the so report timing has the I guess the most number of options. So there is something called PDA mode. This is what we discussed. We discussed the graph based analysis where the skew calculation time time will maintain one skew number 
uh, uh, skew number which is for the worst skew uh, for cells which have multiple inputs. Uh, uh, and then cannot take keep the complete data. So what we could do? Let's okay. Let's look at the worst violation first. Let's look at the report uh, constraints uh, minus all violators. What all violations? Let's and now analyze this design for violation. So right. So till this point, we have understood about the report timing, about the all the options, all the famous options that report timing support. We've already seen in the earlier lab about the inverse, about the mock path. About how to give the pause path groups. Today we studied about the full clock, the full clock expanded, minus rate, CRPR, and so on. We also learned, learned about the delay calculation. Now let's uh, see, let's focus on the, looking at the timing violations, right? What all timing violations are there? How many types of timing violations are there? Now let's do a report delay calculate. Let's do a report constraints minus all violators. Let's so there are so many violations here. Let's do a no split. No split we do when you are writing to a report. Let's do all Now this is what so once you verified that you have applied all the constraints, you have set the operating condition and it is more perfectly, your parasitic reading is correct, your clocks are correct, your clock relationships are correct. Then you come to you know, you write some kind of report which tells you summary of all the violations. This is that report all violations of RPT. Now it's telling me that PCLK has only one endpoint that is violating. For hold, uh, it is first okay. Uh, okay, it's telling me match delay there is only one violation. Now, so because it gives all the match delays at the first, then it is telling me min delay hold clock getting there is one violation, big violation. This is a big violation, might be false. Uh, min delay input group there are so many violations we haven't really specified any input delays so I will uh, we'll let's not go let's not give much importance to this uh, again so now PCLK has these many violations in hold again SDR clock has these many violations for hold this clock has these many violations for hold there are a lot of violations for this clock and so on so it will give me give us again this clock 2 has so many hold violations Removal, there are so many uh, violations. Removal is of a whole type, recovery is of a separate type. So, report constraints minus all violators gives us a good summary of how many timing violations are in the, in the, in the design. And uh, now, we've already mentioned that we are doing, corner, it also gives us the, uh, the max trans violation. So, this is the max trans violation. Now, we've uh, seen that uh, we, we talked about the corner based estimate. And uh, we discussed that there will be multiple corners on which you do SPA. So, ideally, on every corner that you do SPA, you would have to make sure that there is no setup and there is no hold violation or sign off, there is no DRC violation there. Now, we see that there are some hold violations in the worst corner. So, that means these hold violations are going to get bad, they are going to get worse when you move to the best corner. So, this, this constraint sign. So probably you would want to separate out this constraint file into two files. One file which will define the environment conditions like this, and second file which actually defines the clock. The second file will be common for the constraint file without the environment conditions will be common for all the all the corners, worst case, best case corners because they don't change. The clock definition will not change. But the first file which defines the link library will be different for different conditions. So you do now do when you do the best case analysis, you here you read the min db and then you do the analysis. So but I see that here there are a lot of hold violations and these hold violations will get worse when you move to when you probably move to the, the best case form. Now let's look at uh, one path for example here report timing we saw that there is one set of violations in the in the timing so we see there is one violation in the peak clock group, one set of violation in the worst case corner. So if I make sure that this violation is not there, then I will only have the whole violations to take care and then I will probably go to the best case corner and do the analysis there. Now since I have only one violation left, I am very tempted to try out PBA. How do I try out PBA? I say minus PBA. 
I don't do it for the complete group, right? So what I'll do, I'll I'll narrow my choice first. I have to narrow my choice. I say group C C L C and minus slash. So lesser than zero. Let's say for any uh, for any clause, even you have let's say more than one variable. This is generally popular. This is what I'm talking about. So report timing minus group a particular clause slash lesser than zero will give me, and I increase the number of paths to let's say uh, five. Now in this case, there's only one path, but Again, this approach is generally what I'm talking about. Now, for such case where you have, let's say, you selected a few number of paths with slash lesser than zero, now you can give PBA mode and give exhaustive. So the option can be exhaustive. So you give exhaustive. Now see the slack is decreased a bit, although it hasn't given us a clean report, but it is saying recalculated five paths. Why? Because we gave max five, returned one path. It, it, it first initially had five paths, returned one path because only one path was satisfying this criteria. The maximum number of paths recalculated is five. I don't know because it, it sometimes maybe the internal algorithm like takes a look at the max path five first. It recalculated. It recalculated the transition number, and this will give or this gave a better slack. So it gave us some advantage. But not as good, as, not a great advantage. But still, it gave us some advantage. In some of the paths, which are very, very long, it will give a lot of advantage. If you have a very long data path, it will. The more, the longer data path you have, the more uh, PDA will give you advantage. This is what. That is why. So see, what are such a critical path? Such a critical path are usually the paths which have greater logic depth, which have more number of stages. Such paths. PBA will go give more advantage because uh, such paths will have cells with multiple things, and obviously some transition approximation because of graph data. Again, the thing to note here is that PBA is reports the slack will always be either better than or equal to the graph based analysis. That is why we say that graph based analysis is pessimistic; it is more conservative. Because PBA is an accuracy improvement over graph based analysis. Second, the hold when a hold pass critical, hold pass are critical when the logic depth is less, when there is less delay. So PBA will probably not give you a lot of advantages for those. Why? Because the logic depth still is small. There are just three or four, maybe two or three stages in the data path. So not not a lot of PBA advantage. So this is how you do a PBA analysis. So uh, next uh, in next lab session, uh, I will uh, talk about how to fix setup and hold times. What all to check before fixing setup and hold times? Uh, we will talk about a class of commands which come under what is analysis and time time. It's a very very it's a slightly advanced lab, but it will be very very useful when you go go into the industry and work. So this is. Uh, So till this point, we have learned about how to set up the time frame system. We learned about parasitics. We learned about the constraints. We learned about different reporting commands. In the next one, we will explore how to actually fix time. We will talk about that. Thank you.